Hi, welcome to our Hangout on Air. We are really excited to explore strategies for integrating multiple information sources. And we've got a great group here today um, to do some brainstorming. And we hope that you'll join in um, using the question and answer um, feature throughout the session. So we'll take a few minutes just to introduce ourselves and, and then dive right in. So my name is Claire Moore. I work at the Metropolitan Museum of Art supporting teacher programs and I've got my colleague here. Hi everyone, my name is David Bowles and I work here with Claire at the Met. My responsibilities focus on guided gallery experiences so I train and support the people who lead guided tours for school groups when they come to visit. Thanks David. And hi. Andrew, <laughs> you're up. <laughs> Um, hi, everybody. Uh, my name is Andrew Moriades. I'm a high school English teacher in Mission Viejo High School, uh, mostly teaching ninth and 10th grades, California. <clears throat> Great. Thanks, Andrew. Mm -hmm. And Becky. Hi, I'm Rebecca Singleton. I'm a, an art teacher at Crockett Middle School in Hamilton Township, New Jersey. And um, this is, uh, I have an interesting little visitor here. There's a fly right by my video screen. <laughs> <laughs> So my apologies if that interrupts. <laughs> <laughs> no problem. And um, last but not least, we have Annabelle. Yes, hello everybody. I'm Annabelle Howard, and uh, I run a nonprofit called Big Fun Education, and we specialize in creating sociable learning experiences online. And we have a particular bias towards the arts. <clears throat> Fabulous, Annabelle. Um, so you've met the team and we're really excited to dive right in today to thinking about ways that you can connect in your classroom to museum resources. And so I'll walk you through our agenda. We are essentially going to look at three different resources that can be used in the classroom and spend about four minutes with a short introduction by David and I. And then after each one, we'll do some brainstorming about possibilities. Um, so we'll, of course, invite um, our teachers who are joining us live um, as kind of talking heads within the Hangout. And then we'd love for you to add comments and ideas using the question and answer app um, that will build into the conversation as well. Um, so as you can see, there's three different resources, and we are going to start with 82nd and 5th. So I will turn things over to my colleague, uh, David Bowles, and let me just pull up that resource to get us started. Thanks, Claire. Um, well, this resource that I'm about to, to spend some time exploring, as Claire mentioned, it's called 82nd and 5th. This is an online resource that the Metropolitan developed uh, last year. Its rather enigmatic name refers to our address. Uh, the main entrance to the museum is at the corner of 82nd Street and 5th Avenue. So this resource in a lot of ways is about intersections and finding ways that ideas that maybe you didn't expect to intersect actually do. Um, one of the ways we thought this might be an interesting tool for teachers to think about in terms of integrating multiple resources in, in multiple information sources is that the resource does that in a lot of ways. Um, for each of the works of art that you can browse through on 82nd and 5th, you have a combination of uh, a verbal walkthrough from a curator, conservator, or other content expert. And then there are supplementary materials that allow you to further explore. So I'll show you what I mean. Um, let's go to the first one on the list. The title of this piece is Faith, and the contributor is Luke Sison. And if you click there, assuming it takes me in, looks like it's thinking about it. <laughs> I'm hoping it's thinking about it. Um, would you mind just briefly telling everybody where, how do you get to the 82nd second and 5th resource? Is it through the Met um, Museum's uh, main website, or how do they access that? Exactly. If you go to the Met's public website, you'll get uh, far more options than you could possibly follow in one visit. But if you go through the uh, Collections tab, 82nd and 5th shows up at the very bottom. Okay. Um, so main, main Met Museum website, Collections tab, 82nd yeah. and 5th. I'll come back as soon as I've got this resource loaded. I'll circle back to that and I'll show you exactly how that works. But here we are at, at Faith, and what you've got here are two options. On the left, you've got a two-minute, uh, two and a half-minute clip 
of Luke, who's one of our curators, discussing this particular work of art. It's uh, a relief sculpture, Madonna and Child, by Antonio Rossellino. It was made in the Renaissance. And it's a really interesting talk through, and it gives you a very informal way to explore that work of art. Um, the other option here on the right is the explore option. And this is something that we thought teachers might be keen to think about, because when you talk about relief sculpture, it's awfully hard to understand what you're talking about unless you actually see it. So here's a chance to actually take a good close look at that relief sculpture and really spin it around in a way that you can't even do when you're here in real life. Um, and to see the amount of detail that Rossellino added into this piece and to see the different ways that surfaces rise or fall and create the illusion of space um, that makes this piece so convincing in a way um, when you're actually in front of it. That's awesome. Yeah, it's a really beautiful spot. And in this case, the, the spin only works um, 180 degrees. But if I were to go back to 82nd and 5th, um, if you go to the list view here, it brings them up in a more uh, organized way, at least for my way of thinking. How did you get to the list view? Because I was trying to find that option and couldn't. It's well hidden. <laughs> when you log into 82nd and 5th, you come to this landing page. Right. Scroll down, you'll have the first two sort of highlighted choices. And then if you scroll down here to all episodes, you can uh, see grid view okay. or list view. Grid view is first. Okay. I find list view more helpful for figuring out yes. what I'm actually trying to look at. It was actually one of my suggestions when I looked through. I'm glad you have it. That's great. Ah, it's there, but it's often a, <laughs> a little harder to find. So the other piece I wanted to share with you is um, this piece, the Pensive Bodhisattva. It's a Korean sculpture. Um, and in this case, the rotation allows us a full 360 view. So it goes beyond even further what we could actually see together in the galleries and offers students a chance to really get in and see the kind of... Um, details that the artist lavished on this piece to really give it a sense of life, even as it slowly loads. And within the 180 view, can you zoom in and out as well? You cannot zoom in and out in the spin views, but if you click on the object, it'll take you to another resource that Claire will be exploring later, the uh, timeline of art history, and that does allow you to zoom in on details. Um, so I'm glad you're thinking about that already. We'll certainly travel there in just a moment. So is David's working on, or as not David's not actually working, as the computer <laughs> loading it up, um, and let's take a look at it while it's um, getting the kind of full view. I'd love to start brainstorming some possibilities of how something like this might come in handy, um, or how where you might go with it in the classroom. Sure. Um, well, Annabelle, did you want to share a couple of your ideas first, or did you? How did you want to kind of go about that? I, th I think you had some really amazing ones to start. Either way, if you can remember what's in there, you go for it. Yeah, I have. I have our document kind of opened up in oh, another okay. tab. So. Yeah. Um, no, I, I mean we can start with just you were saying. Uh, I, I loved the one that you were talking about where students were to select um, a specific piece from the 82nd and 5th collection, and then they were to come up with some verbs and adjectives that you know, kind of stirred inside of them emotional um, inspirations based on the artwork. And then they were going to be making um, poems or different artwork or different maybe even like short, you know, writing uh, samples or whatever they wanted to do um, based on their uh, inspiration from the specific piece. And then they can share those poems um, with other people uh, in, in a hangout on air. Um, that way you're kind of getting that different perspective from maybe different cultures, different parts of the world, even different uh, communities within the same state. Um, just their experience and basically like the way they interpret the artwork while still creating their own inspirational work um, based on it. So uh, did you want to go into a little bit more depth about that one? Because I, as an English teacher, that one I was like, oh yeah, anytime I can get my students writing poetry, I'm on board. So I thought that was great. Right. I mean, not that we need to overly, uh, you know, accentuate the common core, but there are things there that I like and one of them is that, you know, every teacher is now, res you know, clearly responsible for, um, 
teaching vocabulary for a start. You know, it's it's about reading across the curriculum, and I think these resources just hand it to you on a plate. I mean, there's just so many ways um, that that you can. Uh, I saw one thing that just now, where I was looking at this right before. I guess it was in. Um, oh, I, I don't think I noticed it. Maybe in connections, where um, yes, you you could give the kids a list of words. Like um, I saw, oh, I know what it was. One met many worlds, and um, I saw the teachers could mimic what the Met has done uh, so beautifully, but sort of in reverse. Um, in other words, you could give kids a list of words. Some of the words that were used here on the site: are reconstructed, iconic, draped, posed, expansive, industrial, organic. You can give a list of words to the kids and say, okay, now go on the site. And it's like a treasure hunt. Can you find something that matches with these words and then talk okay. about it? Annabelle, that's a really interesting idea because as you look at the 82nd and 5th resource, those objects are organized just as you say in these sort of large archetypal themes, these big umbrella themes that a kid could really investigate. You could have five kids working on the same th word but come up with very different examples. So it offers a lot of great divergent outcomes in different ways that students can answer the same question in different ways. Right. Oh, I love and the that. teacher can check the box for you know academic language and domain specific language, and you can don't worry about it. Just have fun with the site and with the words, and listen to the kids speaking. I I um, have brought in a specific um, comment. I like that um, that the visuals are engaging and current. Um, the way that the the site is set up. Um, because if you are not current with your technology, students many times will tune you out. Um, so it's helpful to me that it doesn't look so dry. Um, and also that I have such limited time with my students that I need quick draws and those short films are very helpful. When I teach a lesson, I try and pull in, I love YouTube clips of an artist speaking about their own work. Well, obviously you can't always use that um, because not all those artists are with us. Mm -hmm. So this gives me a chance to hear from an expert, somebody who has credibility, but in a current way. And so that's very helpful. The other nice thing I notice about those videos that, again, for brevity's sake, we're not showing here, but I encourage all of you to spend some time exploring them, is that the experts, as they share those ideas, they're doing so in a very relatable way. So they're yes. so using vocabulary that students can use in their day-to-day -day language. They certainly introduce academic vocabulary, but it's always with some context to help you figure out what the meaning might be. Right. I also um, just wanted to bring up, I'm noting um, some of the ideas um, that the people who are watching and streaming the session online are um, putting into the document here. Um, so one person is talking about, you know, having, um, embedding the link to the, one of those resources on a blog site and posing some questions that students might answer in a blog. And I just saw another one um, pop up, it looks like Jean, um, has an idea of creating a screencast an audio report on the art pieces and then have that saved as a podcast, a YouTube video, or post it on a class page for others to see. So a lot of great ideas here. Yeah, I think also what they can do is um, you can share slides in a Hangout on Air. So there's a, because you want the students, you know, talking with other students from different parts or whatever. So when they're doing their Hangout, they can create their presentation for a piece of work or um, whatever they're doing and, and share their slides with somebody else even though they're not directly in the classroom. Like, kind of like what you do with a screen share, but it's a little bit more uh, formal with the slides that kind of go through and it's a lot easier for them to see and so forth. So I think that would be a great way to incorporate that as well. I think that's a great idea. Great. Um, perhaps it's time to check out our second resource. Let's do it. Conversational things. <laughs> so um, the second resource we're going to explore together, assuming I can get the screen share to work, um, is actually an interesting collaboration between the Metropolitan Museum of Art and Google. We're looking now at Google Art Project, which if you go to just Google, Google Art Project, you'll certainly drop right in. And if you Google Metropolitan Museum of Art along with that, you'll get a chance to step into the galleries virtually. And it doesn't have the entire museum, I checked, but you've got about two-thirds of the museum that you can virtually walk through. And there were two key aspects to this that I thought might be interesting to highlight. Here, I've landed us in the American Art Galleries of the museum. And 
right off the bat, I mean, you've got such a sense of place with these objects that you don't get from an isolated image of, you know, a JPEG on the, on the website. But what also happens as you explore is that it gives students a chance to see interesting comparisons that curators have organized. So, for example, here, see if I can back up just a minute, we've got two paintings of generals in the American Revolutionary War, and they're next to each other for a reason. <laughs> Something, someone's calling. Um, and I can see there's a little bit of glare on there, which, you know, certainly is a reality in the galleries, but uh, what's interesting about this is these two objects, if you looked at them in isolation on the website, it might be hard to see how they're next to each other. But seeing them here physically next to each other as they are in the galleries, it gives you a chance to take a look at the different ways that artists were portraying generals like George Washington versus other generals involved in the conflict and a chance to think about different messages that these artists were trying to send from everything from costume to pose to setting um, de even down to the brush strokes. Um, so that's one interesting way you could use this resource. Those, Another, are, great. those are great. Sorry. Yeah, <laughs> great. I mean, right off the bat, just... they, they make such a hilarious pair. <laughs> oh, yeah. I, I'm engaged just sitting here watching it. That's, that's so rad. I like that a lot. Yeah, you've got George Washington here sort of casually hanging out on this cannon. <laughs> Dude's yeah, right. Looking powerful and regal and in his nice blues and... Yeah, right. Yeah, but in this very casual, like, oh, I didn't hear you come in, sort of look. <laughs> and then compare that to this fellow, who's extremely posed, and in this very sort of artificial... Obviously, there's something artificial about both of these, but whatever. You can imagine how this conversation can go on for quite a, t quite a while. So the one thing Google Art Projects, it gives you a chance to compare and contrast objects that are physically grouped together, but you might not find them next to each other online. The other advantage of this tool is it gives you a sense of scale. So here I'm continuing to walk through the American art galleries and I'm approaching one of our most famous pieces, Washington Crossing the Delaware. Wow. Uh, this is a painting that I know a lot of teachers teach with when they're introducing American history. And what you really lose is its sheer scale. So here we are underneath this. And to give you a sense of scale, there's the doorway. <laughs> <laughs> so this gives you a chance to really understand not only the coding and clues and symbolism within the painting, but also the sheer volume of paint and canvas that wow. went into the creation of this resource and the chance to think about what the artist Leutze might have been trying to say to us by creating such an incredibly overwhelming experience. Great, so we'll turn it over to some brainstorming and possibilities of where you might take this. And again, if you're um, watching this online, feel free to use the question and answer area to add ideas um, and other suggestions. Um, in, am I on, Claire? Yes, you <laughs> yes, are. We've okay. got in my, in my um, school district, I have such a wide range of children uh, from such a wide range of backgrounds, and I have a small population that literally do not leave their neighborhood except when they take the bus to school. So this enables me to expose them to other things that they wouldn't experience, and if we're going to have a visit, um, we occasionally take the kids on field trips. If we're going to have a visit, it gives them the chance to ease some of the anxiety, to become comfortable with the atmosphere. Um, you know, So on a most basic level, it's very helpful. Thank you. I, I think that's I think that's amazing. I mean, for, for just to go back to the generals, that that was really fascinating to me. But so two things that came up to me. Um, the first one, I loved that you saw just such a sense of purpose in those paintings because I feel as though a lot of times students they don't really take into consideration whether it's a work of literature or a work of art, like why it was actually made. They just think like, oh, someone just drew a picture of a dude and like that dude's famous or that dude's old and you know whatever. <laughs> but, like to kind of like. You know, I mean, really, they, they don't think that, like, there was actually, like, such, like, an evaluative, like, thought process of, like, putting, you know, George Washington posing a certain way and the other general, you know, in a, in a pit of red with fire and so on and so forth. I mean, that just spoke volumes to me. So I think that that could really engage a conversation between students in terms of, you know, um, artist purpose. Um, mm -hmm. The other thing that I thought was kind of cool was, you know, as an English teacher, I'm single subject, so I know that I deal with teachers at my site who are, like, hey, you know, Metropolitan Museum of Art, like, that's great for the art teacher, but, like, how is that going to be a resource for me? You know, I teach mm -hmm. history, or I teach math, or I teach, you know, science, or whatever. And something that came to me, maybe as, like, a history teacher, I mean, we're trying to think globally, right? Like, we're trying to encourage a global education with our different students and different perspectives. 
we know who George Washington is as Americans, as American teachers and so on and so forth. You know, we know what the Civil War is about to an extent. We study that in our education, but um, people from around the world may not necessarily know our, our rich history. So what an opportunity for our students to take an opportunity to share some of their knowledge and teach people from different, you know, ethnic backgrounds or different cultures about our history. And in return, I'm sure um, that the you know Metropolitan Museum of Art has maybe you know Islamic art or different art from you know different parts of the world that they in turn can then you know teach our American students about what they know of their history and of their culture and uh, I think you're just really building perspective and understanding and and really um in, in a long run maybe even like you know some compassion and and uh, and evaluation that way so I think that that was really really cool I, I dug that a lot. Yeah, there are a lot of ways I could see that working along those lines. And you're right, you can explore many, many, many other collections in the museum using the Google Art Project. I also was drawn to your idea, Drew, of this art as propaganda. Yeah, <laughs> yeah totally. Get students to think about, well, you know, these Absolutely. paintings don't just happen in a vacuum. Someone's sending a message. Mm -hmm. Someone right. the artist to send this message. So let's, let's think a little more critically about this thing. Totally. Um, when I'm working with students, I like to play the what if game. What if this was a different color? What if um, this element was not in the painting? Um, so it's nice to be able to compare and say, what if this artist used that style? What if this artist changed, you know, and they can, they can see it right there in people who are famous or artwork that's hanging in the Met, and then they can do it with their own piece as well. Totally. Yeah, and also because they, obviously everything is visual here, um, people forget that visual, we're, we are visual learners and uh, we're more likely to remember and engage and sort of enter a topic if, if, the, if the introduction is a visual one. So it's, it's a great introduction and then I know that somewhere, and I can't remember exactly where again, you have wonderful essays, short pieces that are written and, that, and those are, you know, that, that's a clear next step. But I think just studying the painting and just asking what do you see, you know, as <laughs> simple as that, um, can often, you know, just coming at it with no assumptions and no leading question at all and just see what different people see because they're not going to see the same thing to start with. Um, and then once you sort of develop that engagement, then there's a little bit more interest. Well, let's see what, you know, the historians say about this or the curators say about it. Then it's like, oh, okay, all right, fair enough. I think those those essays were in the uh, the timeline section. Is that right? Some of those yes. essays, which is our next and final resource to share. Oh, well, can, <laughs> we can we drive next? And I wanted to mention one other um, idea that came up in, in the Q and A app. Um, so someone saying you can take the virtual tour and integrate it with Google Map and have a journey that marries history, art, geography, etc as a lesson um, in Google Earth you can add this link along with images, audio, and video um, to give a kind of comprehensive experience. So this is Jean. That's awesome. It is. I just put it on top. <laughs> I think that's great. Um, before we move on to the timeline, can we, I, I like to also encourage, you know, uh, kind of that real world application of, um, you know, whether it's uh, on the job thinking or critically thinking or creating um, when I'm working with my students and I think of a resource like this, I always think of like kind of like the four C's and I, I have to bring up the common core, I'm sorry, but um, you know, kind of like, <laughs> I know, sometimes it's like a taboo, sometimes people are like, oh yeah, bring it on, and sometimes there are people like, how dare you? No, um, no, we were thinking about that even when we chose this idea of integrating multiple information sources, we're trying to think of ways that can make the common core work for us. Totally, I mean, I'm a big advocate of that too, the multiple sources, but you know, I was thinking, um, Another big thing, like I like again, purpose or motivation, or you know, um, if you're the curator of the Met, you know, and you have a gallery that you want to put together, or you you know, you have an idea, like how do you structure? I mean, the, the fact that those two generals were put next to each other, that wasn't a mistake, you know. I mean, that was purposeful, and the fact that that painting, um, the George Washington cross, crossing the Delaware, right? That's that's what that one was. Mm -hmm. um, is is you know, right in the end of the uh, the room. I mean, when you walk in, like you can't miss that guy. You know, I mean, it's not just put on the wall with other paintings around it or whatever. I mean, there's a thought process behind that. And I think it's important to encourage our students to think about, you know, hey, this is a real-world job. These are real-world problems. And maybe they can even create their very own um, gallery based on either museum that they find in the Met or, you know, take the inspiration from the uh, galleries and the curation uh, in the Met and even go out and find their own, you know, interests and giving them that autonomy. I mean, some students might be uh, really interested in, uh, you know, anime or in other different types of uh, art that's street art, you know, whatever it is, and they can curate their own gallery and kind of put it by either 
theme, purpose, uh, you know, chronology, I mean, whatever really, you know, they see based on their own Met experience. So I think that'd be a great way for them to, again, think critically, why was this done? Um, I think that they could also be creative. And then they can kind of pair them up with a different, you know, partnership or a different set of people. And they could, again, be sharing ideas across, you know, borders. Um, and that's where I think the communication and the uh, collaboration come in as well. So, again, using the Hangout on Air, um, that would be a great way for them to communicate their ideas and experiences and, and creative input. So I think that could be a great way of, to use that uh, resource. Yeah, I love how the Google Art Project feed service allows you to actually sort of pluck your own works of art and create your own basket to put them in and makes oh. it very, very shareable. So you can create a set of paintings of women in the American Revolutionary War. You mm -hmm. can create a set of paintings of generals who, you know, look different <laughs> or, you know, whatever you want to make it. Sure. And it becomes Ooh. eminently shareable. Oh, that's great. And of course, postcards. If you're love yeah, tech, you could do your virtual walker as a class or and just bring out a stack of postcards and do sorting. How many different ways can I group these, you know, or sets of these together? And so thinking about how in museums, sometimes a work of art is on view in a certain context for an exhibition, and then later it's represented in another context, and how that changes the work or how it changes the conversations you have about the work. Um, I think those are all all great points, Andrew, to think about that extra layer that curation has um, for students as, as a possibility for exploration. And an opportunity to explore the word framing because, you know, you're framing not only the literal painting or, you know, work of art, but you're framing a discussion. You know, it's, it's the use of the word that that's, uh, could, be, could be interesting in itself. Fabulous. So um, I think we'll go ahead and go on to um, our one last resource, and then we can certainly continue on our brainstorming. So I'm going to go back to our screen share, and then I'll navigate over. And then I'm going to navigate. You did what I did oh before. no! Apologies. <laughs> we went down the wormhole. Let's wrong try it oh again. Oh my gosh, that's a wormhole. It's vertex. <laughs> it's Matrix. <laughs> I will make that stop. <laughs> <laughs> I did that during the rehearsal. It's very easy. Yeah. <laughs> okay, so just so you get a context, if you are on the Met homepage, you could go hover over Collections, um, and all the way at the bottom, there's the Timeline of Art History. Right above is the 82nd and 5th, which we took a look at earlier. Um, so this is just below the Timeline of Art History. And this is a section of the website where you can explore um, by looking at a wor world map. You can think about different places in the world, um, a timeline, or you can go right to thematic essays. And I think, Annabelle, this is what you were referencing earlier. Mm -hmm. um, so you could use this as a way to narrow down works of art you might select for teaching. So say, for example, you are an American history teacher and you're studying a given moment in time. So I've shaded the part of the world and then below as I scroll across you can click the moment in time. And so once you select that area you'll see works of art across the top. These are essentially it's the history of art told through the Metz collection so it doesn't include all of the works in the Metz collection but um, representatives for each um, moment in time in different places. Below, you'll find an overview of kind of this moment in this place. Key events, if you're teaching a new um, moment in time or place or, or need to get familiar on your, whether it's for yourself um, in planning or for your students, there's just broad key events here that not only relate to what was going on in the art world, but broader um, social events, historical events. Um, you can click the tab here for works of art, all made from this time period and scroll down. Any of these um, can be clicked on for more information. And then of course related content and here you find all of these fabulous essays that are already narrowed down by the place in the world, the moment in time you're considering. Um, and I suspect it's quite small, um, the text, but I will um, just share a couple of examples of the types of things that come up. So one example of a thematic essay is America Comes of Age. And you'll see um, selected works of art across the top. Each of those are clickable. Um, information below. So this one is framed around a key moment in time in America. 
and you can see related essays, so you can really dive as deeply um, as you like. Um, so these are really closely related essays, other essays that might be of interest. And then, of course, you've got maps, you've got the timeline, which it'll go back to. Um, so these are really rich informational texts by, written by curators from the museum, um, noted historians, where you can find reliable information. And I'd say, on average, they're about um, a page um, to two pages printed, if you were to print them, so um, fairly concise. Some more so than others, of course. Okay. Yes. And if you already knew um, of a particular work of art, you can also add in, um, you can search by the name of the work of art or the name of the artist. So we'll put in Washington. So I'm putting in Washington Crossing the Delaware, which was that work David showed, just as an example since we're familiar with it, um, to show you what you might find on that page. So it's loading up. Um, but you can see here that you have all of these different views of the painting that are clickable. Um, you get the basic um, information from the label, a short description about this work of art, and then you have links to all of this related content. So there's a thematic essay, George Washington, Man, Myth, and Monuments. So thinking about representations of Washington over time and his various um, roles throughout history. You can look at index terms. And then at the bottom of each of these, there's citations. And um, more and more, we're able to um, put things online as full PDFs. So you could really you know, pursue your research as deep as kind of time permits and, you, and depending on the goals of your project. Um, so those are just a couple of different ways, the thematic essays and then that process of narrowing down um, to think about um, a place in the world or finding a work of art that might be useful. So I'm going to open it up, um, the floor, for ideas and possibilities. And I'll get David and I back here on screen. Um, sure. Did, did any of, uh, anyone else want to chime in or? No? Well, okay. <laughs> so, <laughs> I, okay. Um, I just I, I was thinking actually for a couple of days about the the timeline one because I, I think it's such a valuable resource. There's so much information there. Um, so one idea that I had was kind of this like role play idea, if you will, um, about maybe like an art thief, <clears throat> kind of giving students like two separate roles. Like at one point they can be kind of like the thief, and at the next point they can kind of be the detective. So the idea was to allow students to go through the timelines. Um, whether you want to kind of narrow down their focus or their search it is really kind of up to the teacher, I think. But um, they can kind of go through and pick out certain paintings and certain pictures that they think they kind of like want to steal. Um, and then they can, you know, keep those to themselves and create uh, clues um, for another set of students to kind of go on a bit of a treasure hunt and, and find them throughout the history of time. So the idea is like, they stole them from different time periods, and then they kind of went and to hide them from authorities. They put them, you know, in different time periods. So they took something from, you know, the ancient Roman times oh, and put it nice. in 1950 or whatever it is, you know. So they have to kind of use the timeline to go back and forth by using clues. And we mm -hmm. were talking about, you know, different media sources, and I thought it'd be kind of cool if, like, you know, maybe you give them a few days to put together their clues, but they could do like video clues. They could do, you know, text clues. They could do image clues. You know, they could show maybe like a close up of one part of it or whatever, and say, you know, this is the I don't know. I mean, you know, they could be creative again, which is, in my opinion, like the most important thing in a classroom. Um, so they're creating, you know, clues. They're going through the timeline. They're being exposed to a wide variety of sources, and in essence, they're doing their own research through the timeline source because. Um, that you know they have to put together their clues to help their um, their other partners or whatever it is. So um, each side can do that, and then they can you know find other people um, on a hangout, and they could switch their clues and their ideas. And then the uh, other side has to go through and find each piece and put together the timeline appropriately, right? So they're kind of like recreating a timeline from okay, this was from you know 18. 100, this was from, you know, 1940, this was from whatever, and they can kind of put it in order that way. So again, they're creating clues and ideas, and then they're also recreating a timeline, um, all using that resource. So there, there are a couple of things that the teacher can do, of course, um, in terms of, like, assessment, because I know that's a big thing. Uh, the assessment could be 
of course, you know, maybe they have to set a certain number of clues or they have to, you know, steal a certain number of art pieces, you know, meet that quota. Um, they have to make sure that the timeline is in the right order. You know, that could be a way to assess them. Um, they can do a blog post on their experiences, kind of on their reflections of maybe what clues were the most effective and what clues were, you know, a little bit hard to follow. Again, giving feedback to the original creator. Um, again, making them understand, you know, maybe what media uh, communicates the most effectively for the other students and so on and so forth. Um, so that, that could be a cool thing to do for the timeline. It, was I clear on that? Because it's kind of like an idea like up in space, but it's, it's, it's out there. I mean, th there well, are a couple of things that you would have to do, you know, to make sure that it works perfectly, but that's kind of what I thought. I thought it'd be fun. I, I love that idea of really engaging students and making a scavenger hunt rather than giving them one and yeah. you're putting it together of really empowering them and of course you know you're motivated you're making your own you know your own concept um, and then you'll go deep in your research to find you know what's what you really need and what's what's most relevant you know for your topic so I love that of just turning it around and even thinking about the multimedia possibilities for yeah. a hunt doesn't have to be the old print out the eight and a half by eleven sheet and walk through the museum. Um, sure. so I, I really like that innovative approach. Yeah, thanks. And you know, I think um, too what you were saying about uh, oh shoot, I just forgot my idea. Um, <laughs> <laughs> I'm sorry. I, there was something that you said that I, I was like, oh yeah, and add on to that. Oh well, we can. We uh, it might come back to me if not. <laughs> Other sorry idea? Uh, maybe maybe kids could prepare some questions. Um, it could work in small groups or it could work between different classrooms. Prepare questions about the timeline or any of those three resources or all three of them. Um, and uh, they will know the answer to their own question, but they, the other team is on camera and they have to talk out loud and, and we see their thinking, well, where should we look for this? Would it be an 82nd and 5th? Would it be on the timeline? Would it be? And they can have, you know, a lot of classrooms have one-to-one. -one and have a lot of, you know, computer power in them, um, or at least a couple of computers in the room, and they can um, use the tools live online and learn to talk out loud and sort of show their thinking, if you like, and um, they can be timed how long it takes them to answer the question, so that we assume that given enough time, you know, everyone will be able to answer every question, but the one who, who the team that does it the quickest is the winner. Hmm. So I, like I, a web quest? Yeah, sort of like that. Yeah, I like that. You know, I, I, I wanted to add to that. You know, I think um, on Annabelle's idea and the idea earlier, when you empower the students to, you know, find their own questions or to, you know, create their own clues or whatever it may be um, for another set of students, I think that that does really um, force them, or not force them, but they willingly um, dive deeper into the information. You know, then say if you were just to give them some you know simple questions and like okay go on the timeline and find you know what painting was painted in 1806 blah 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 I mean they're just gonna simply look for the answer but when you kinda give them that challenge of hey you're going to be doing this for another set of students that you maybe have never that you've never met before or what have you um, they're gonna wanna one you know you kinda gamify it a bit you wanna make sure that they're uh, you know stumping the other t uh, students or that they're like they're gonna go further and beyond what they traditionally would if the teacher just gave them that opportunity. So I think that's a really good idea, Annabelle. I think they'd be really into it. I, yeah. I love it as a audience is sorry. I was just saying the, the authentic audience. I mean, I do a lot of work with theater on here in Google Plus, and having an authentic audience makes so much difference. It's kind of become a cliche at this point, but I'll say it anyways. Um, the the students. It's kind of that thing where. If you have students and the audience is just the teacher, they'll just make sure that it's good enough. Whereas right. when, it's the, when it's the student, they want it to be good, you know? Yeah. Yeah. They want your peers to be impressed. Yeah. I kind well, of butcher that. Because it gets... <laughs> <laughs> that's, that's, the, that's the general idea. <laughs> I think Becky was trying to chime in a minute ago, so yeah. I'm going to give Thank her... Thank you. Thank you, Claire. In, in addition to using it um, for the lessons, I love it as a planning tool and as a, uh, an enrichment tool for the students. Um, so if I'm teaching a lesson, I can find a parallel. What else is going on at that time period in other parts of the world? And just bring fun facts into a lesson, and it's, very, it's right at my fingertips. I don't have to work so hard for it. Um, the other thing is that um, I love that students, I have, you know, as many of you probably do, I have such a wide, wide range of ability and disability that this gives them a chance to get enrichment to find more um, when, you know, you don't always have time in that 40 minute class period to give them more. That's a good point. 
Um, so I want to open up the floor. We have a lot of people who have been streaming um, online um, to ask this, take this time to ask us um, collectively um, as a group any questions you have and any other possibilities. Um, we can really just open up to the floor to any connections to any of the resources we've shared today or other ways um, you're engaging. And feel free to ask of the teachers or David and I. We're all happy um, to chime in. And so as, as people are typing, um, one of the things that kind of, uh, as we were talking, one of the things I really noted is this thinking about the timing of information. And mm -hmm. I think that comes a lot, you know, in a lot when you're thinking about those timeline essays or other informational texts you might be able um, to find online of that really taking that inquiry-based approach, looking closely, seeing what information you can get by looking alone, generating some inferences, and then it leads to this intrigue you're wanting to know. No more. Whereas if I had just started by saying, you know, front loading all of the information, saying this is what it is, I mean, it really, I think it kills it. Yeah, it reminds um, me of what Annabelle mentioned earlier when she said, you know, just just get kids in front of it and ask them what they see. And then once you get, <laughs> once you get the ball rolling, then you can present the kinds of information that are not visible, the kinds of information that a student would need to go somewhere for. Yeah. So any of these um, programs could be used very easily as a springboard for a blog topic or a message board also um, and I and I love that you know the kids can get a variety of different um, things to inspire them to write about art and communicate with each other about art I was really excited earlier um, how Andrew was talking about students from different parts of the world connecting with another. Um, as an encyclopedic museum at the Met, it's so, you know, we essentially have kind of globe trotting across the world, but it would be so fantastic to have people from different parts of the world, you know, that might even be represented geographically um, by the Works on View talking um, with students. Um, so that exchange to get those different voices of thinking about how do you see it from where you sit. Um, I think I wasn't, I'm not sure if it was Annabelle or Andrew, but talking about what we bring to our experience with works of art. You know, we are we are coming to it with our experiences and may see it in very different ways. Yeah, I think I think that's really important too. I, I, I love that idea. Um, and I think that's really the most powerful part of having um, the ability to do hangouts on air with uh, you know different schools and different um, people. And um, I know that Many people who are watching this or who have seen this know already about the uh, Connected Classrooms um, community on Google+, Plus. but if they don't already, um, then that's a great way to connect with other educators from around the world to organize an event like this. Um, in addition to connecting with the uh, Metropolitan Museum of Art, you know, it's, it's increasing that, um, that professional learning network so that you can meet with other teachers and collaborate and organize ideas um, for uh, you know, communication using these resources. So it's the Connected Classrooms Workshop, I believe, is uh, the correct title. Annabelle, do you know the exact? I don't have it in front of me. Do you know the exact? Like, Google? is it Connected Classrooms Workshop? This is, is it? Yeah, there you go. Oh, look at that. <laughs> <laughs> that's, a that's with I that's am a fan girl of this of that community. I really am. It, they it's do amazing things. It's brilliant. There, I think at this point there are probably like ten to eleven thousand um, educators just in that in that uh, community, and it's and it's run by Google and um, Lauren, who uh, helped you know put this uh, event together for us. Um, they're just so helpful uh, in helping teachers put together their own connected classroom activities, um, as well as you know uh, teachers just kind of. Uh, or excuse me, as an offering opportunities as well. That's that's how I initially got involved in the um, connected classroom community. Is um, they offered an opportunity and I took it. So for those teachers that are out there that are curious about connected classrooms or doing um, hangouts on air or working with the Met, uh, museum, um, that's how you can do it. And I think it's really an effective tool and resource for teachers um, as well to get connected. So I encourage people to get uh, be a part of that if they're not already. Um, so thanks so much, Andrea. And I wanted to mention um, to everyone joining us online that we have um, kind of the the group of ideas um, that the teachers participating on camera um, shared, and that's a shared document on the event page. So if you wanted a write up or didn't quite catch all of it. Um, during the session, you can go there, as well as um, links to all of the resources 
David and I um, shared during the program today. And I did see um, someone's chimed in asking about resources that would integrate um, music with art. So I thought we'd speak to that um, just a moment, just to really um, align with the um, interest here among our group. So of course, if you're looking at a work of art that relates to music, we have um, musical instruments are actually part of our collection. A key piece of information you might want to know is how does it sound, um, which is a natural um, outcome. So I'm pulling up our 82nd and 5th. Um, I don't think we're on screen share. Oh, and I'm going to, I'll switch us over to screen share. I'm pulling up our 82nd and 5th um, feature, and I'm going to navigate down um, to one example of those um, other types of information sources beyond the videos you can find here. And I'm going to scan really quickly because I'm pretty sure it's at the bottom of the page, so apologies for whiplash on the internet. <laughs> There's um, one piece in particular we're both thinking of that can help with Noma's question. There is a um, slick gong we have here. Um, let's see where. Oh no, where did our slick gong go? Let's do, we'll do some live problem solving. Um, so there's a slick gong we have some example of footage of. Let me see if I can get to it through our search the collections page. Um, and we are starting, I would say broadly, we are starting to integrate more and more um, media um, across our website, whether it's video or um, audio tracks or even thinking about kind of audio tours you might find um, if you're navigating in the museum, knowing that you know there's just a range of type of information available and that we want our online visitors to be able to access those as well. Um, so let's do a search. This is in our collections online page. So this is a way you can find out about works of art from across the collection and get kind of the basic information. So I'm going to type in slit gong, which is a type of instrument, um, to see what comes up here. Oh, it's rad. Where's that from? There it is. We um, will pull it up here. I'll uh, show you right where. So Vanuatu. It's from a small island in the Pacific Ocean near Papua New Guinea. Wow. It's to give you a sense, this thing is about fifteen feet tall. No way. Wow. Yeah, I would say we come up about our heads are still below where the kind the of slit. <laughs> below the slit. Yeah. Wow. Um, wow. So this is actually an instrument and you can strike it and the slit down the middle is where it's it's kind of the voice of the ancestors. So when you strike it, it's like the voice of the ancestors um, coming to life. And I know we've had at one point um, uh, an actual link to the sound. I'm not sure if it's here now. We seem to have reorganized the website, but our, our whole goal in navigating here was to help Noma think about different ways that you could bring the sound of works of art to life. So an object like this that we cannot strike in the galleries, the, oh, on our website, <laughs> you can find a playing of the sound of it, and you can really make that object come to life, um, especially works of art that have ritual purposes like that. I suspect it'll be reloaded on our 82nd and 5th because it was there, so check back. Um, but I think it does add such an interesting layer, um, and it's key information. You know, you're wondering about it there, and so it's just fascinating. Um, so I'm just going to double check and see if there's any other questions or comments from the group. And let's see. I think that one's from a little earlier. Okay. I, th I think we've addressed most of the questions. So I just want to go ahead and thank of all of our um, on-air participants. Thank everybody who joined in online um, to really um, participate in this session, share your ideas. Um, it's been such a pleasure. And do um, go back and take a look um, at the uh, event page to browse through those links and some of the great ideas um, the team here, Andrew and Becky and Annabelle, um, shared prior to the event. They've got some really just creative possibilities. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> Bye. <laughs> <laughs>